oh hey, let's talk about chapter 12, the administrative control of hazards. So we discussed last week in length the engineering control of hazards and how engineering control is the preferred form of hazard control in the hierarchy of hazard control. Administrative control is the next level down. So what is administrative control? It is the procedures that limit exposure to hazards. So written down things, rules that people have to follow in order to avoid hazards. So these administrative controls fall into two broad categories, which we'll speak about. The first are programs. Programs are documents that explain how hazards will be controlled. So these are plans or permit system, things like that. The next are activities. Activities are the programs that put into action. So if you have a schedule that says you need inspections every year, the program is that you know, written down statement that you need that inspection and what's gonna go on in the inspection. And the activity is the actual inspection itself, okay? So activities include housekeeping, inspections, audits, and monitoring. So let's get into administrative programs. These typically fall into a pyramid. So at the top of the company, you have very broad mission statement type policies. So the guiding principles, this is usually something really broad, like our company's mission is to make great products and keep everybody safe. The mid-level management is who takes those exact words and then teases out what they really mean. So how safe, how great are the, how safe are we gonna keep people? How great do we want the product to be? There's always a balancing act. You can't say you're making a hazardous chemical, right? You wanna keep it away from populated areas, but you also can't put your factory on uh, Easter Island, right? You have to have it reasonably close so that you can get transportation to it. So you can't totally eliminate risk. So in writing these procedures, which are just instructions for how to do things, these companies figure out that balance and get it written down. So uh, some of the other programs are plans, which are methods prepared in advance. Planning is really important for potential situations. So most companies have spill plans for chemicals, plans for fires. Um, inclement weather, all sorts of plans, so everybody knows what they're supposed to do when these things happen. The principles are sets of rules or standards that people are supposed to follow. And then rules are statements of how to do something or what may or may not be done. So all of these depend on things like government regulations, so what OSHA or the EPA has set out, company requirements, and then site-specific, plant-specific, or even unit or department-specific instructions. So most companies want to be slightly safer than the OSHA or EPA requires, so that if OSHA or the EPA changes their mind, they're still ahead of the curve and they don't have to make any changes. Some more examples of administrative programs are evacuation and accountability plans. So just about anywhere you go, and certainly any public building, has evacuation routes posted. So where do you go if there's a fire? Assembly areas are usually indicated. So if you work in an office, there should be a plan if there is a fire, or more likely a fire alarm. Everybody assembles, and then there's a head count. So there's somebody walking around with a clipboard, making sure everybody's there. This is just practice for when the real thing happens and you really need to tell the fire department if somebody is in the office, okay? The next set of programs are the cardinal rules. So these are very important, but they're not law per se. It's just something that most companies have these very important rules that typically result in termination if you break them. So the first is alcohol. So most companies will fire you on the spot if you show up to work drunk. Uh, drug use is typically met with the same result. Things like firearms, this is a big problem in deer season. People will leave a, a deer rifle in the trunk of their car or their pickup truck and go to their plant site. If there's no fire alarms around, allowed on the plant, which most plants are like this, 
and somebody finds a firearm in your car, they don't care that you're hunting that weekend. You have a gun at work and you'll probably get fired. Uh, fighting, most companies will fire you if you're caught fighting on the premises. There's just really no excuse unless you're a boxer or an MMA fighter, right? And even, <laughs> even if you are a boxer, uh, you know, if you punch somebody after the final bell, you'll get charged for assault and that has happened. So there's really no excuse for fighting either. And then a lot of companies will have a no smoking policy, uh, cigarette smoking outside of uh, posted areas. And, you know, some companies will fire you for that. Some companies won't. That's not as important. Uh, one example for this textbook specifically, because it deals with the chemical industry. If you work at a gasoline refinery and you get caught smoking, you will get fired and you might get criminal charges because that's essentially a it's, attempted arson at that point, right? So the next program are called mutual aid agreements. So very large plants, especially things like chemical refineries, have their own firefighting force that are well-trained and they know how to do their job. But if there's a major conflagration, they will need local firefighters to show up and help. So before the fire actually starts, most plants have what are called mutual aid agreements where they lay out a set of plans. If a fire uh, occurs, it reaches a certain size, the local fire department will come in, they know what to do, and they can help out. And they don't have to figure it out on the spot. The next program is called the buddy system. So this works in two ways. So one method of the buddy system is that you have two people working together, accomplishing basically the same task. So the idea is that two heads are better than one, so if somebody's doing something wrong, the other person can check them and make sure no mistakes happen. But both workers are in you know, harm's way at this point. They're doing the same thing in the same place. The other buddy system is when you have one person hang back in a safe location and keep an eye on the person doing the dangerous work. So this is really common for welding or working in confined spaces. So if you're welding, you'll typically have a fire watch. That'll just be some person wearing a welding helmet that's just making sure that no fires start. That's their only job. They shouldn't be doing anything else. They're just watching you, making sure no fires get started. Same thing with confined space work, whether it's welding or anything else. One person hangs out outside of the confined space and keeps an eye on an oxygen meter and they're ready to pull the other person out if the oxygen levels get too low. So the last thing we'll talk about with administrative programs are the PPE programs. So PPE has to be uh, written down. You have to let people know what they're supposed to wear and what situation. So there's essentially three categories of PPE use. The first is for scheduled operations. So you run this machine, you wear this PPE, easy enough. The next is for investigation of hazards. So if an uh, alarm goes off and maybe there's a gas leak, but nobody's really sure, you don your PPE and basically check it out, right? And then the last is for accidents. So say there's a fire and the local fire department puts on their fire gear PPE and goes to fight the fire, right? So three levels of PPE that all have to be written down. Everybody should know exactly what they need. So next, we'll talk about administrative activities. So again, these are programs put into action. So the first is training and information. So there's basically three levels of training. The first is your formal education. So whether it's high school or college, typically things you learn outside of your company. The next is your plant and site specific training. So a lot of this you'll get when you first get hired to just learn the lay of the land and then periodically after that. Then the next is just general dissemination of information. So memos, meetings, daily safety briefings, that kind of thing. This all falls into the categories of activities. The next is housekeeping. So this prevents slip and falls, which is a, a major cause of injury in the workplace. 
Uh, a popular method of this is the 5S system of, you know, the lean system. It's good for housekeeping, is excellent for morale. Uh, people just work better when their company is clean and tidy. The next activity are safe work permits. So these are permissions to perform maintenance in hazardous areas. There's a couple different kinds. Hot work is for things like welding and cutting where there's gonna be high temperatures, things could catch on fire. Confined space where you could run out of oxygen. And then lockout tag outs where you're working on electrical equipment or even pressurized equipment and you make sure it's turned off so nobody can turn it on while you're working on it. It's the most common type of lockout tag out. The next are inspections. So these are safety, health, and environmental checks. They're usually performed by management locally at the company. These are proactive steps to find problems before they become real hazards. Okay? Audits are similar, but they're usually performed by outside personnel to determine whether a company is in compliance with their regulations and perhaps even government and higher level regulations. And the last activity we'll talk about are accident investigations. So these must be professional and thorough. The problem is nobody wants to take blame. We live in a very litigious world. Lawsuits are very possible anytime there's an accident that results in injury, loss of life, or damage to equipment. Investigations are usually a result of either an incident, which is a hazardous situation where no injury or process upset occurred, an accident where a hazardous situation did result in an injury, equipment damage, or process upset, or a near miss, which is an unsafe act without incident or accident. The difference between a near miss and an incident is kind of semantic. Uh, every company will have their own definitions for what counts as a near miss and what counts as an incident. But these typically all trigger an investigation to find out what went wrong and how it can be handled in the future. So that's it for chapter 12 administrative control of hazards.